Good afternoon. Our first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And as ever, in order to get as many people in as possible, short and succinct questions and answers would be appreciated. The first questions are on Commonwealth Games, Sport, Equalities and Pensioners' Rights. And I call question number one, John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it encourages cooperation across local authorities on equality issues. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robison. Local authorities are di directly responsible for equality issues within their remit, including compliance with legal requirements. It's therefore, for authorities themselves to identify and develop any suitable opportunities for cooperation in relation to equalities, Scottish ministers aim to create conditions for better collaborative working and cooperation across sectors, including local authorities, to improve performance against the public sector equality duty. John Finney. Uh, thank you. Uh, I thank the, the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Cabinet Secretary, I recently met with a senior local authority official uh, about gypsy travellers, and the individual commended to me the fact that they were doing a needs assessment for the local authority area. I asked what co collaboration there was with adjoining authorities, because clearly, by the very nature of that community, they aren't a, a resident in one place, and I was surprised to know that there was, at that stage, I think since rectified, no cooperation. What are you doing to ensure that that doesn't happen? both in respect of local authority issues, but also health issues. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, if the, the member wants to write to me with more information concerning the, the local authorities involved, I'll certainly look into that matter. I mean, it does um, obviously make sense for local authorities to work together uh, across these issues. There is an opportunity with the, the work that's underway to deliver, develop the uh, new um, strategy and action plan for Gypsy Travellers to make sure that these issues are addressed. Um, but as I said at the beginning, if the member wants to write to me with more detail, we can make sure that uh, those issues are picked up with the local authorities, but also that we pick that issue up as taking forward the strategy as we, over the next few months. Thank you. Supplementary, Hans Alamalik. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to stem the report uh, deadline of a uh, number of females. Students. I'm sorry, Mr. Malik, I think you may be ahead of yourself. That might be the next, next questions. Up. I thought you were asking a supplementary. No. Thank you. Question number two, Annabel Goldie has not been lodged and an explanation, an understandable explanation has been provided. Question number three, John McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with the UK Government regarding the level of single tier pension. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robison. The Scottish Government has not yet had any formal discussions regarding the level of the single-tier pension. However, recent announcements at the Conservative Party conference suggest that the UK Government will set the level of single-tier pension lower than our expectations. Therefore, I have written to the Minister of State for Pensions seeking urgent clarification on this. John McAlpine. Thank the Minister for that answer. And I, too, was very concerned to hear the 142 uh, pound figure quoted by UK ministers recently, which of course is far below the £160 a week offer contained in the White Paper, which would have ensured better pensions in an independent Scotland. Um, does, the, does the minister agree, agree with me that the, the offer needs upped by the UK government? Indeed, the best way forward would be for pensions to be devolved to this parliament. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I uh, would agree with that. The level is significantly lower than the Scottish Government's expectations. However, this may be a reference to the indicative starting rate set out previously by the UK Government rather than a final determination of the level of the new pension. But that's why, of course, I've written to the UK Government seeking uh, urgent clarification on this. We argued in the referendum campaign that a starting rate of £160 per week for those with uh, full entitlement would be fair and sustainable, helping those reaching state pension age to have a decent retirement. As uh, the member has uh, said, uh, we've expressed in our submission to the Smith Commission, we maintain the view that decisions on welfare, including pensions, are best made by the Scottish Parliament in line with the, the needs of Scottish pensioners. Thank you. Question number four, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures the fair treatment of disabled people. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. The Scottish Government is actively engaged in a programme of work to improve outcomes for disabled people across all areas of daily and public life, using domestic legislation and international treaties to lever change and to measure improvement. We are committed to working in co-production with disabled people and have provided funding of almost £2.4 million pounds over the period 2012 to 2015 to build the capacity of disabled people's organisations in Scotland. Claire Baker. 
thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the Blue Badge Scheme for drivers or passengers with mobility problems. While there was support for the tightening of the regulations to address what was the, inappropriate, the occasional inappropriate use of the badges, I am um, continuing to be contacted by constituents who are raising concerns that they do have mobility problems but they have been refused the badge and then they have been refused again when the appeal comes around. This is particularly happening at the point of renewal for the badge. Um, has the Cabinet Secretary had any discussions with the Transport or the local government minister about concerns in this area and the impact it is having on people with disabilities? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, well, I would be happy to have those discussions with colleagues. Uh, I am aware of some issues my, myself arising uh, from uh, application for a blue badge. Um, I think there have been some significant improvements made, um, uh, particularly around the, the abuse of the system um, that are to be welcomed. But if the member perhaps uh, wants to write me to me with a little bit more detail around the issues that she raises. But meantime, I'm very happy to speak to colleagues who have uh, more direct responsibility for the Blue Badge scheme, and I'll do that after this session. Thank you. Question number five, David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how we will improve the uptake of the pension credit scheme. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robeson. Uh, as the member will be aware, pension policy is currently reserved uh, to the UK Government. Nonetheless, uh, Scottish Ministers are committed to ensuring that all Scottish pensioners receive the support they are entitled to. The Scottish Government has already provided support uh, funding to Age Scotland's helpline, which ensures older people have access to quality assured information and assistance across a range of topics such as money and benefits. We have also agreed um, an additional funding grant for uh, 2013 to 2015 to support Age Scotland in its partnership with Silverline and to extend the scope of the current helpline service. I met with Age Scotland earlier this morning and I'm encouraged by their commitment to this and I'll continue to work with them and other stakeholders to consider how we improve uptake. Thank you. David Stewart. President Officer, does the Cabinet Secretary support the work of Rights Advice Scotland in developing a benefit calculator for older people to encourage the uptake of the pension credit scheme, which only one out of three eligible pensioners claim? Yet across Scotland, as we enter the winter months, thousands of pensioners will be facing a bleak hard choice between having enough to eat and keeping warm. What action plan does the Cabinet Secretary have to increase the uptake of pension credit? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I certainly do uh, support the, the work of Rights Advice Scotland. In addition to Age Scotland and Citizen Advice, all of whom provide hugely important uh, information to pensioners. And of course, as I set out in my original answer, uh, we support uh, Age Scotland in particular uh, and its helpline, which has received a huge number of calls uh, from people to be able to provide that information and, of course, encourage people who are absolutely entitled uh, to apply for pension credit to do so and will continue to do so uh, to, to make that happen. Um, we also, of course, have set out in our submission to the, the Smith Commission uh, that we will continue to argue the case that decisions on pensions are best made here in the Scottish Parliament uh, in line with the needs of Scottish pensioners. And I'm sure uh, if we uh, can uh, get control over pensions through the Smith Commission, then we can do more uh, for our pensioners, including those on pension credit. Thank you. Question number six, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government um, whether it will investigate tax breaks for sports clubs. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. The Scottish Government, through uh, Sports Scotland, our national agency for sport, has invested significantly in Scotland's sports clubs, an investment which is central to the development of a world-class system for sport in Scotland. In addition to this direct financial support, we would encourage all eligible sports clubs to make full use of the range of tax breaks and other options available, including business rates relief. In Scotland, mandatory business rates relief of 80% uh, is granted to registered charitable sports clubs and registered community amateur sports clubs. In addition, councils have discretionary powers to grant further relief up to 100%. Of course, further investigating tax breaks um, would only be a real option with full fiscal levers being devolved to Scotland. Liz Smith. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, you know that from uh, this Parliament we've had several uh, debates about the legacy, uh, particularly of Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup, and that some of these debates actually focused on the point about uh, the legacy that can be left uh, for uh, financial benefits to some of these, uh, particularly our smaller sports clubs that often find it very difficult uh, to survive. Uh, I note what you say about some of the advantages uh, that can be spelled out. What facility does the Scottish Government uh, have to allow these sports clubs to actually know which benefits they can take advantage of? Cabinet Secretary. 
Oh, I think Liz Smith make, makes a reasonable point, and it is um, knowing perhaps about the tax relief that's available. Um, Sports Scotland obviously uh, is a um, have a, a huge amount of information on their website. What I will do, though, is to make sure that they're proactively um, informing uh, those clubs that uh, they can apply for that relief. There are some other um, important uh, developments on the horizon which are important to those clubs, like, for example, the changes to uh, uh, water and sewerage charges uh, that are, are happening, where uh, exemption is going to be uh, awarded subject to certain conditions to all charities uh, with incomes of less than 200,000 from April next year and that could make a big difference uh, to some of the overheads that uh, some of those clubs have and obviously with the debate around uh, tax powers and the Smith Commission there may well be additional uh, tax powers that are worth uh, debating in this place once we know what those are but in the meantime I think it's important that Sports Scotland inform those clubs about the rates relief and I'll make sure that happens. Thank you. Question number seven, Jane Baxter. To ask the Scottish Government what the legacy of the Commonwealth Games will be for disadvantaged young people. Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robinson. Legacy 2014 has young people at its heart. There are many examples of Scottish Government programmes which use the Games as a catalyst to support disadvantaged young people in overcoming barriers and achieving their full potential. Sport Relief and UNICEF are using the power and inspiration of sport to improve the well-being of vulnerable young people, both at home and in the wider Commonwealth, empowering them to make positive changes to their lives. Programmes such as Scotland's Best are providing those young people furthest removed from the labour market with new development opportunities, which will support them into employment, further education and training. And I would encourage um, Jane Baxter and other members to visit the Legacy 2014 website for more information on all these legacy programmes. Thank you, Jane Baxter. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I welcome efforts that were made to, for example, provide free tickets for disadvantaged young people to be able to access events at the Games. However, clearly this in itself will not help to create the kind of long-term change that is needed. And I appreciate the comments that the Cabinet Secretary has made about the sort of efforts that are in place. But I wonder if you could tell me that if, a, if an independent assessment will be made of the effectiveness of the legacy actions she has outlined. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I can confirm that. A, a com comprehensive analysis of um, all of the impacts of the Games, whether that's the economic impact um, through to the, the legacy impact, all of that uh, will, will happen and there will be a, a, a very comprehensive uh, post-Games legacy report in the summer of next year and I'm very happy to, to keep Parliament uh, updated about that. Thank you. Question number eight, Gavin Brown. Thank you. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what the priorities are for the sport and legacy budget in the next financial year. Cabinet Secretary. I'm delighted to say that the Scottish Government will continue to make significant investment in 2015-16 to build on the fantastic successes of uh, this year, including uh, £2 million of funding specifically for legacy to ensure that we capitalise on the inspiration generated by the Commonwealth Games, as well as investing £24 million in the National Performance Centre for Sport. £6 million will be invested in a new National Parasports Centre, which recognises the importance of equality of opportunity and the success of Scotland's Scotland's para-athletes in the Games and over £4 million for Sport Scotland's Institute of Sport to continue to develop Scotland's world-class system for sport and £14 million of investment in more than 50 Scottish government bodies of sport to the benefit of clubs and athletes and communities across Scotland. Gavin Brown. I'm grateful for, for that answer. How does the Elite Athletes programme in 15-16 compare to the current year in terms of resource spending? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, Sports Scotland's budget has um, remained um, at a, a fixed level, at a frozen level, but it is the same as it was uh, for the previous year. Uh, going forward, though, of course, Sports Scotland's um, uh, elite uh, athlete programme is also supported by lottery funds, of which Sports Scotland receive uh, a, a substantial uh, amount. Uh, going forward, though, we are still in discussions with Sports Scotland about the elite athlete programme, and uh, Commonwealth Games Scotland, of course, um, are also part of those discussions to make sure that uh, Team Scotland do receive the support that they require uh, when they compete in the Gold Coast in 2018. So those discussions are still underway, um, but uh, elite athletes can be assured that they will receive the support that they require to perform at the very best. Thank you. Question number nine, Christian Allard. 
To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the European Commission regarding equalities issues. Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary for Training, Youth and Women's Employment met the Director General for Justice of the European, European Commission, Ms. Francoise Lebel, on the 19th of May 2014. Ms. Lebel leads on equality issues for the Commission. The focus of the discussion was the Commission's most recent report on equality between men and women, published in April 2014. Christian Allard. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for your answer. Uh, will the Cabinet Secretary agree it is important that all EU workers have equal rights? This applies to those like me who come from Europe to fill the skill gaps in our buoyant economy in the North East, particularly, as much as to our young people deciding to work abroad in Europe. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I very much uh, agree with the member. There are uh, 160,000 people from other EU states who have chosen to live and work in Scotland. They make a massive contribution to Scotland's economy and uh, to our culture. The Scottish Government greatly values both the contribution that EU migrants bring to our economy and society and the benefits of freedom of movement enjoyed by our own citizens to live, study and work in all uh, EEA countries. EU migrants who move to Scotland to exercise their right to free movement within the terms of European law have a legitimate reason to be here and will always be welcomed, not only for their contribution to our economy, but also the vibrancy and diversity they bring uh, to uh, our nation. Uh, so I very much uh, agree with, with the member, and I think that's a sentiment that we would want to send out from this Parliament. Thank you. Question number 10, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its equalities campaign, One Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. The One Scotland Equality campaign was initially launched on the 28th of July to enable the Scottish Government to communicate about equality issues with a single voice and purpose. This was supported by the launch of the new One Scotland website, www.onescotland.org. Following the forced marriage phase of the equality campaign launched on the 30th of September, the next phase will focus on race and LGBTI equality and will be launched on the 6th of November. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that update. One of the key partners to the campaign is Bemis. In their submission to the Smith Commission, they have suggested that if equalities legislation was devolved to the Scottish Parliament, then it would make sense to also devolve fully powers over welfare and employment. Will the Cabinet Secretary reiterate her support for this analysis and outline what benefits this would bring? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, well, I'm very uh, pleased that Bemis uh, and others have uh, submitted uh, to the Smith Commission arguing for this. Uh, I think it's very uh, Im important that equality legislation um, is uh, devolved to this place um, alongside welfare policy and employment policy. Um, I think uh, by doing so, we can uh, not just uh, do more around some of the work we're already doing, but uh, it takes our ability to do even more uh, to ensure that uh, the, the One Scotland campaign and the sentiments behind that are, are felt by everyone in practice. Uh, and by having um, powers over these matters, we can take much further action to make sure that uh, people have um, absolutely equality of opportunity living here in Scotland. A supplementary, Kezia Dugdale, please. Can I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's remarks with regards to the devolution of equalities? Um, does she support the devolution or, or the ability to legislate for gender quotas? And if she does, would she use it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think we've made our position pretty clear on that. And in the Smith uh, Commission submission, uh, we have been very clear that we want uh, the e equality legislation here in, in Scotland for a purpose, and that is to make sure that we build on the very good work and some of the progress that's already been made in uh, women uh, in public life and being visible. As I've always said, uh, you can't be what you can't see. And I think that's very important. And of course, uh, we would be able to use uh, that equality legislation to really transform uh, not just public life, but to lead by example in other sectors in Scotland uh, and Scottish society as well. Many thanks. We now turn to questions on training, youth and women's employment. Question number one, Alison McInnes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the reported 11% fall in employment of people of working age in Dundee between 2011-12 and 2013-14 has had on women and young people. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. 
Presiding officer, the latest data from the annual population survey July 2013 to June 2014 shows a drop of 5.6% in the employment levels between 2011 and 12 and 2013-14. The employment level for women in Dundee City decreased by 2.5% over the same period, while the youth employment level increased by 5.9%. The latest data from the Labour Force survey, however, shows a clear and sustained strengthening in the Scottish economy, with the number of women in employment at the highest level since records began and youth unemployment at a six-year low. Thank you, Alison McInnes. Thank you very much for that answer. Unemployment is falling and the Scotland's economy is growing thanks to the hard work of both of Scotland's governments. But does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that there is still a lot of hard work to do to ensure that all our local economies benefit from the progress? And can she tell me, in the light of these statistics, what steps the Scottish Government will take to support Dundee in meeting its target of more and better employment opportunities for young people and 68,000 people of working age in employment by 2017? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, while the national indicators for women and young people um, across the country are moving in the right direction, uh, and indeed in Scotland, uh, we're outperforming uh, the rest of the UK. Um, if I can be absolutely clear uh, that as the economy strengthens and improves, that we need to ensure uh, that nobody um, is left behind. Um, and the member may be interested to know uh, that in terms of modern apprenticeship starts uh, in Dundee uh, from 08 to 09, that's increased from 200 138 uh, to 714 uh, last year. Uh, Community Jobs Scotland, Youth Employment Scotland Fund and the Employability Fund are all well utilised uh, in Dundee and she may also be interested to know about a vocational uh, English as a second uh, language course uh, in Dundee targeted at women uh, that is focusing on various sectors uh, such as tourism, hospitality, bioscience, uh, finance and customer service as well as the early years in education. Angus MacDonald. As the uh, Cabinet Secretary has stated, we have the uh, highest number of women in, un in employment since records began. And with youth unemployment at a six-year low, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that even with the limited powers over the economy at our disposal, Scotland's economic health is improving? Cabinet Secretary. I mean, the figures do speak for themselves. Um, the economy has grown for two years and output is now past uh, pre-recession levels. However, I'm acutely conscious that while youth unemployment is indeed uh, at a six-year low, it still remains too high um, at 16.7%. Uh, uh, and indeed, when you look at youth unemployment pre-recession uh, in Scotland, it was at 13.2%. So our ambitions have to be far, far greater than returning to pre-recession levels uh, of uh, economic performance and youth unemployment in particular. But I agree with the member's point that uh, full fiscal responsibility uh, for the Scottish Government uh, would enable us to do more. Jenny Mara. Given the rates of youth unemployment in Dundee and the effect on women, can the Minister tell me, the Cabinet Secretary tell me, what she is doing to turn around the situation where nearly 6,000 students were unable to get a place at Dundee and Angus College to train for the, for the skills that they need this autumn? What is she doing to address that? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, uh, I do want to point out to Ms Mara that the youth employment situation uh, in Dundee is improving. Uh, last year, the youth employment rate for Dundee was 47.8%. It is now 51.1%, uh, and that's an important uh, move in the right direction. Um, but, of course, there is far more to do, uh, not just in Dundee, but the length and breadth uh, of the, the, the country. I would be happy to look at any specific information she has uh, about further education uh, in Dundee and to share that with the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Education. But there is no doubt about it that the college sector is indeed delivering for more young people who are studying uh, more on full-time courses that lead to recognised qualifications that improve uh, their overall employability and work prospects. Can I say at this stage, I know there's a lot of interest in this topic, so can I make a plea for short and succinct questions and answers to match, please? Question number two, Hans Alamalik. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to stem the reported decline in the number of female students studying part-time vocational courses. Cabinet Secretary. 
Thank you. Uh, women form the majority of college students. Uh, students can benefit from record levels of financial support, uh, over £104 million this academic year in bursaries, childcare and discretionary funds. Uh, this includes an entitlement payment of up to uh, £1,215 per year to help loan parents with childcare costs. Um, additionally, we have invested £6.6 .6 million pounds in 2013-14 and are doing so again in 2014-15 for additional part-time opportunities. Hans Adam Alec. Thank you very much for that uh, response. Uh, the substantial drop in women taking up part-time places across the board has mirrored in vocational courses. I have a constituent come to my office struggling to find a suitable training opportunity to fit her caring responsibilities. Can the, cabinet, can the minister assure me that action will be taken to increase the economic in involvement by producing, uh, providing females the means of obtaining education whilst balancing a family and or part-time work in the future? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, President Officer, as I indicated in my original answer uh, to Mr Malik, uh, we are continuing to invest in part-time places, uh, an additional £6.6 .6 million uh, this year uh, and uh, next year. And if I could remind Mr Malik that there is an all-age career service uh, available to everyone, irrespective of gender or age, via Skills Development Scotland. Um, I don't know the particular details um, of his constituent, um, but I'm happy to receive information uh, regarding the lady that he uh, seeks to represent. Thank you. Briefly, please, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that through the Wood Commission recommendations, we can develop a world-class vocational education system that matches the best-performing economies in the EU? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, the recommendations from the Young Workforce Commission uh, are indeed very important. They will help us build on the great progress we've made in schools and in the college sector and in our career sector uh, to reach uh, world-class uh, vocational education. And the important uh, aspect uh, of vocational education is that it is very closely linked uh, with low levels of youth unemployment uh, but also uh, it is crucial uh, with the right approach to vocational education that we can address the needs of all young people and young women in particular and address the barriers uh, that women face in the workplace and such issues as occupational segregation. Thank you very much. Question number three, Dennis Robertson, has not been lodged for understandable reasons. I therefore call question number four, Elaine Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it is, it is taking to address youth unemployment in Dumfries and Galloway. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, this Government has invested in a wide range of employment initiatives which are directly helping to create sustainable employment opportunities for young people in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, these include, for example, over 2,500 modern apprenticeship starts in the last three years, 145 young people supported through Community Jobs Scotland in the last three years, the creation of 341 new jobs for young people through Youth Employment Scotland Fund and almost 1,000 starts on the Employability Fund uh, between this year and last. Thank you, Elaine Murray. Uh, thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary, for that response. Uh, in June 2012, uh, the Cabinet Secretary convened a Youth Action Summit in Dumfries and I wonder if Ms Constance can advise what region-specific actions she subsequently took or indeed intends to take as a result of that summit with regard to addressing unemployment and indeed underemployment uh, of young people in the region as both youth unemployment and underemployment remain higher than the Scottish average. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, and I appreciate that the claimant count certainly is marginally higher in Dumfries and Galloway uh, than it is uh, for uh, the rest of the country. Although I do have to say that the youth employment rate in Dumfries and Galloway um, has increased substantially over the year. Um, it's now at 63%, and that's above uh, the national average. But nonetheless, the member is absolutely right uh, that underemployment is indeed an issue for young people, and I think particularly in uh, rural areas. Um, and that was one of the reasons that we went uh, the length and the breadth of the country, uh, holding uh, discussions um, in you know, many parts of Scotland because there are very unique challenges uh, in you know, rural parts of Scotland and that has certainly helped to inform our views um, about how we progress with vocational education and training uh, and the particular needs uh, of rural areas. The needs of rural areas has particularly informed the work that we're doing in the strategic group uh, on women in work and also about the added 
flexibility uh, that we need, um, bearing in mind that for some young people um, in rural areas, but it could apply to young people with disabilities, that their uh, transitions can be disrupted. So where we can, uh, we've actually extended the offer uh, of national schemes uh, from you know, 16 to 24 and increased that up to 16 to, to 29, for example, with the Youth Employment Scotland Fund. Briefly, please, John McAlpine. Thank you. Is South West Scotland to benefit from EU funding through the Youth Employment Initiative? Could the CAPSEC outline any response she has received from the UK Government on adopting the European Youth Guarantee to ensure faster intervention with unemployed young people to help them into work? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Ms McAlpine raises two important issues. Um, indeed, the south west of Scotland, including Dumfries and Galloway, will benefit from youth employment initiative funds. Uh, we are meeting with our uh, local authority partners uh, to progress that and discuss uh, the rollout of that rather substantial fund. In terms of the European Youth Guarantee, it's no secret that I and this government uh, are wholeheartedly in favour uh, of a European Youth Guarantee and indeed this Parliament uh, voted in favour of that position. Um, I have written to the UK Government a number of times uh, on this issue, um, making clear uh, that the work programme and the youth contract are failing to intervene uh, early enough. And the last reply I received was from Esther McVeigh uh, just last week on the 24th of October, I think, uh, where she said that we do not think uh, the UK endorsement of this initiative would either be necessary or cost effective uh, and I strongly strongly uh, dispute that uh, we have to prevent youth unemployment from becoming long-term unemployment and that means acting uh, from day one of a young person's unemployment. Thank you. Question number five, Siobhan McMahon. To ask the Scottish Government how it helps young people with learning disabilities into employment. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government recognises that young people with disabilities can face additional barriers to entering employment and our aspiration is that with the right support they are able to find uh, suitable and fulfilling jobs in mainstream employment. Uh, supports for young people with learning disabilities such as activity agreements uh, providing tailored learning, uh, targeted employer recruitment incentives and employment and training opportunities through Community Jobs Scotland. Uh, we are ensuring that Scotland's most vulnerable young people, including those with learning disabilities, have the supports and skills that they need uh, to be successful in the workplace. Thank you. Siobhan McMahon. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the Young Scotland Scott Talent Programme run by the Scottish Consortium for Learning Disability. I know that this is an initiative she supports, therefore, can the Cabinet Secretary commit to funding the pro programme going forward, given the fantastic results it has achieved in giving young people the first opportunity at employment? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I have uh, attended two Young Scotland's Got Talent events. I have even got a T-shirt uh, to prove it. And if I knew that Ms McMahon was going to ask a question with regards to Young Scotland's Got Talent, I would even have wore that T-shirt today. Um, there were tremendous events um, that absolutely blew me away. Great networking events for young people with learning disabilities and proudly shown what young people with learning disabilities can and do achieve uh, in the workplace. Um, I have already provided £31,000 to support uh, to events. Um, I can't make any promises given finances are always tight um, but if we as we progress through the financial year find uh, that there is some scope uh, for further support we will indeed do that. Thank you. Question number six, Kezia Dugdale. You asked the Scottish Government how the Employability Fund supports women into work. Cabinet Secretary. The Employability Fund was introduced with the fundamental aim of improving the outcomes for unemployed women and men right across Scotland. The fund allows training providers greater flexibility to adapt to provision to individual client and local labour market needs and will deliver uh, 17,150 starts each year. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? I have got a breakdown of the Employability Fund here and there are only 861 women over the age of 25 that have been able to access the fund. That is less than 5%. The number of women that have received it in Perth, East Lothian and in Aberdeenshire could be counted on one hand. I wonder therefore how her government can claim success for women going back to work when so few have received report support from the Employability Fund. Cabinet Secretary. Um, from, from my experience in terms of figures that I have seen, about a third or 36 per cent of women receive support from the Employability Fund um, across the country. And I accept that there will indeed be uh, regional variations and it would be interesting to understand the reasons uh, for those regional uh, variations. I think it is true, given that the Employability Fund took over from Get Ready to Work and Training for Work, 
that these were programmes that tended to be more utilised uh, by young men, and that will be still reflected in the employability fund figures. Um, fewer women are referred to the programmes because um, young women leaving school uh, tend to have positive destinations. More young women go into positive uh, destinations. However, um, Skills Development Scotland did publish their Equality Impact Assessment for the Employability Fund um, earlier this year, and they are committed to looking at a more diverse uh, participation and to having less gender segregation uh, in the programme. I'm particularly conscious that while young men uh, tend to be uh, fall out of uh, education and training than women, if you look at the, the NEAT figures, um, but I am very conscious that the, the figure for young men has fallen where the figure for young women needs uh, has remained static. So there are issues that we need to address there and we need to dig behind the headlines figures. Question number seven, Drew Smith. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Can I ask the Scottish Government how it supports women in taking up places on training courses? Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government recognises that women can face challenges in accessing training and is taking a range of steps to address them. Uh, for example, in implementing the recommendations of the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce, uh, the Scottish Funding Council and Skills Development Scotland have been asked to take action to reduce gender segregation in their courses and programmes and report on progress. Drew Smith. I thank the Cabinet Secretary very much for that answer. Um, since this Government came to power, the number uh, of women uh, accessing college courses has fallen um, very dramatically, and at the same time, childcare costs uh, have uh, risen to become uh, amongst the highest in Europe. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary agree um, that one of the first priorities should be the provision of childcare places to any parent with a child under five seeking to access a college course? Cabinet Secretary. I think Mr Smith needs to recognise that women are not underrepresented in our colleges. 53% uh, of college students are women and 52% of full-time students uh, aged between 16 to 24 uh, are indeed women as well. And we must also recognise that in the year ending June 2014, Scotland had the highest percentage of females uh, with NVQ Level 3 or equivalent qualifications in the UK at 63.3%. So we have to be proud of that level of achievement uh, but of course we want to continue to take further action uh, to reduce all the barriers uh, that women continue to face. Um, you know, my commitment uh, to universal childcare and indeed uh, of this government is absolutely uh, clear and I just hope that Mr Smith will also join us in getting the full range of fiscal and welfare responsibilities to actually achieve that. Thank you. Question number eight, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government what it considers the skills needs are of the West of Scotland economy. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is committed to working with partners to increase sustainable economic activity across regions of Scotland, including the West of Scotland. Uh, responding to the skills needs of employers and businesses uh, across Scotland is absolutely crucial, and it's crucial to maximising our, our potential. So through Skills Development Scotland, uh, we have committed to establishing a robust, evidence-based understanding of Scotland's strategic workforce skills assessments. Uh, SDS will shortly publish a series of regional skills assessments developed with local partners to inform future skills planning and investment. In this way, we are ensuring that our skills and education system remain closely aligned with the needs of employers and regions across Scotland as a whole. Neil Bebe. Um, can I thank the Minister for that answer? Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that the skills needs uh, do vary across Scotland? We need to ensure that regional skills needs are being met. And with 140,000 uh, cuts to college places across the country, would she also agree to undertake an analysis of what the impact these cuts on training opportunities has had in places like Renfrewshire and other areas in the west of Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I think regional skills assessments for local areas are indeed very important. They will be developed in collaboration with uh, the Scottish Funding Council, Scottish Enterprise, local partners, local authorities, um, and they will need to be aligned with outcome agreements for colleges, for example, but also community planning partnerships as well. But to focus on some positive news, Mr Bibby might be pleased to know uh, that the youth employment rate in Renfrewshire has actually increased to 59.1% and the claimant count uh, for young people in Renfrewshire has decreased so that there are 500 less uh, young people uh, claiming uh, job seekers allowance and other related benefits. That of course uh, should be good news uh, and indeed that claimant count is now lower uh, than pre-recession levels. I think some evidence uh, that the policies of this government is working. And if it is brief, a supplementary from Stuart McMillan please. 
Thank you, President Officer. And I welcome the comment, certainly from the Cabinet Secretary, uh, uh, that she just mentioned there. But also, I welcome the Scottish Government's action in securing a buy for Ferguson shipyard in Port Glasgow. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the closure would have resulted in a loss of valuable jobs and skills in the west of Scotland and also the Inverclyde area? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, of course, I agree wholeheartedly that had Ferguson's closed, this would have resulted in a, a loss of valuable skills, not only from the west of Scotland, uh, but across Scotland as a whole. And the impact that that would have had uh, on families and the communities uh, would indeed have been uh, devastating. So instead, uh, thanks to the investment and ambition uh, of Clyde Blower's capital, Ferguson's uh, will indeed remain an integral part uh, of the Inverclyde community. Thank you. I'm afraid that uh, concludes the time available for questions this afternoon. And we have to turn to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 11301.